Hello, this is a lecture on the perceptron. It's a re-recording of a class that was uh, lectured at UC Berkeley as part of STAT 157. We had some audio problems, hence the re-recording. What we're going to do in this part is we will talk about how to implement the perceptron in Python and to see how it behaves. And the first thing we need to do for that is we need to import our trusty deep learning framework, in which case this is import mxnet, then we import the array and autograd, plotting routines, and in the end we just set a random seed. Okay. First thing we need is to create random data. So we want to create a separable classification problem because the perceptron requires us to have separable data. This is what getFake does. You can specify the number of observations, number of dimensions, and then the margin epsilon, which governs how well the data is separated. The first thing I'm doing is I create a fake linear classifier, so wfake and bfake. And to make sure that the weight vector has unit lengths, I just need to renormalize it appropriately, namely wfake equals wfake divided by nd norm of wfake. The next thing I need to do is I need to make some space for the data, namely x and y. And then I need to fill it. So while i is less than samples, so that means we don't have enough data yet, you go and create a random set of covariates. So that's what's going to go into x. And then I look at how well this data can be separated. So for that I compute any dot between temp and w fake plus b fake. So this is like if we were to apply our classifier to it. And now what I'm doing is if the data isn't too far away and also if, so that's basically if it stays reasonably well bounded because that's one part of the convergence theorem. And secondly, if the data is well separable, so that's margin as scalar greater than epsilon, then add the data to my training set. Else, do nothing. Okay, good. And so, let's have a look at what the data actually looks like. So for that, I first need a plotting routine. This plot, plotting routine does nothing else but just go through the data and it performs a scatter plot. Namely, it first plots all the ones and then it plots all the minus ones. So therefore, you need to check if y as scalar equals one, then plot this, otherwise perform a scatter plot with blue. And then the last thing that we need is a contour plot, which tells us the values of our classifier over, in this case, a three by three grid. So that's what plot score does. It just creates an X grid, a Y grid, then performs the corresponding mesh grid and evaluates the function value there. Right. So that's what you get with VV. VV is ND dot between Z and W plus D. Okay, good. So, let's see what this actually looks like. So I'm creating some data. So here I had a lot of blues and a few reds. Let's create some more data. Again, a lot of blues and a few reds. Okay, this looks a little bit more balanced. And so here's some data separated between reds and blues. And it's separated by a margin of 0 0.3. So if I were to set this to 0 0.2, I will get something that's much more tight. And if I were to set it to something larger, let's say 0 0.4, I get something that's very well separated. Okay, let's go back to 0 0.2. Okay, so now let's actually implement the perceptron. And that algorithm is very simple. So perceptron takes as argument a weight vector, a bias, a covariance, and a label. And what it does is, if the data is incorrectly classified, 
So if y times the inner product between w and x plus b is less equal than zero, then it updates the weight vector to be the weight vector plus y times x and the bias correspondingly plus y. And it also returns that, hey, I encountered an error, otherwise it just returns zero and does nothing to w and x, w and b. Okay, and then once we have that, well, we can actually run the algorithm. Because all we do is we just create w and b's as zeros. We then iterate over the data, right? So for x and y and zip of x and y. And if the result is one, I'm going to print out an error and the corresponding contour plot, otherwise I won't. Okay, and of course now you can't see anything, which is why we will briefly switch back to regular notebook mode. And here you can actually see what's going on. So after the first observation, well, so this is the first observation. Well, it now separates, you know, this one correctly from the reds. Okay, so then it makes another mistake, namely this one here. Remember, this is the decision boundary. So this one here was clearly a mistake. It updates it. Now you get something that would separate these two points much more closely. Then you make another mistake. It's this green dot here. And now it starts aligning better with the separator. There we go. Here's another update. Here's another update. And here's another update. And you can see that by now it's producing a pretty good linear separator. Not perfect, but pretty good. If you were to run this a little bit longer, you would actually get the problem classified correctly entirely. We can do that. Let's just run this. Um, you would have to go through the data one more time. Okay, so now the perceptron in action. Let's actually see what happens. One of the issues is that we want to see how the algorithm behaves as I vary my margin, right? Because if I make the margin narrower, the classification bec problem becomes harder to solve. As I make it wider, it becomes harder to solve, uh, easier to solve. So you would expect that therefore, as the margin of separation gets larger, the problem converges much more rapidly to a fully correctly classified solution, whereas otherwise it will take a long time. So for that, what I'm doing is I'm computing the range of margins between 0 0.025 and 0 0.45. So that's a fairly large range of values. And in each of those cases, I create 10 random observations, or sets of observations rather. I then run this until the problem is correctly classified, and then I basically <clears throat> look at the number of mistakes that are being made. So this takes a while, and since it does, well, let's actually look at exactly the outcome of this. So this is a plot of the average number of updates for training. And what you can see is that as the problem gets easier, right, this is the width of the margin, the number of updates decreases. This is what you would expect. Think of it a little bit like when you're taking a class and the class is really easy, then most of the time you'll already guess the answer right. So you will very rarely encounter a new and surprising observation, which would be new and surprising and thus forcing you to learn something new. Whereas if the class is very difficult, then your hypothesis will be updated very frequently. In other words, you will learn a lot, but it's also going to be a lot of work. And the same thing happens for our poor perceptron here. This is also consistent with the radius margin bound, where you have radius squared over margin squared, right? And that's the expected number of errors. Well, that is the upper bound on the number of errors. And you can actually see this in practice here. Now, the only wrinkle in this is that the number of errors that we see here is considerably lower than that radius margin bound. And that has a good reason, because our radius margin bound is dimension independent, whereas 
the experiment that we ran is for a very small number of dimensions, maybe like two dimensions. So the problem is actually even easier than what our radius margin bound would suggest. And that's exactly why we get a little bit luckier and the perceptron is able to exploit that. That concludes our discussion on the perceptron learning algorithm.